Hello and welcome, Breakthrough Success listeners. I'm your host, Mark Guberti, and this is the podcast where you'll learn how to achieve the breakthroughs you've been looking for in your business and life. If you want to grow your content brand, you'll definitely want to add my latest book, Content Marketing Secrets, to your reading list. This book will teach you how to create, promote, and optimize your content for growth and revenue. You can get your copy at Mark Guberti, that is Mark with a C, so markguberti.com slash book. And now, let's dive right into the show. For episode 89 of the Breakthrough Success Podcast, we are going to talk about 80-20 sales and marketing with our guest, Perry Marshall. Perry is one of the world's most expensive and sought-after business consultants who has been endorsed by Forbes, Inc. Magazine, and the most respected entrepreneurs in the world. His works include the world's most popular book on web advertising, Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords. 80-20 80-20 Sales and Marketing, Ultimate Guide to Facebook Advertising, and Ultimate Guide to Local Business Marketing. So without any further ado, I'm really looking forward to this episode. Perry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. And uh, we're going to peel the layers on some really powerful stuff. Um, you know, I've, I have I got an email. Uh, it was actually a support ticket just today. And this guy says, hey, you know, uh, make sure that this gets to Perry. And, and he says, um, he says, when, when I, when I crawl inside your world and start to actually understand this, he's like, like my, my wife thinks I'm crazy now. Like, like I, I'm seeing this everywhere I go. And, and he's, uh, some kind of a sales trainer or consultant and, uh, and he, you know, he, he does that. So, so we're, we're going to take you down a rabbit hole today. And, um, it's going to help you make more money with less effort and uh, probably eliminate some things that are tripping you up. So I, I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Perry, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And that rabbit hole is so enticing. Uh, Breakthrough Success listeners, I promise we we're going to go really deep into that rabbit hole. But as we stand, like looking down at the rabbit hole before we take that complete jump, I'd love to get some background. So can you share with us what first you got interested in the 80-20 principle? Well, um, I got thrown out of my cushy engineering job when my wife was three months pregnant. And unless I wanted to move to a different city, I ended up having to go into sales. And uh, I severely underestimated how difficult that was going to be. I'm like, oh, I can figure this out. You know, I went to a few Amway meetings. I know how to shake hands and fog a mirror and put on a nice suit and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it, it was really quite a bit tougher. And um, I knew a lot less than I thought I knew. And there was the, you know, what you don't know that you don't know factor, which is just brutal. And uh, and so, you know, I would wake up every morning like, hey, time to go to the office and pound the manufacturer's directory and try to get in to see more people. And, you know, it's just one obstacle after another, after another. And this went on for a couple of years. And, you know, we spiraled into debt. And, um, you know, I had a little baby at home and I'm working all the time and I'm, I'm not, you know, not seeing the little girl. And, um, my wife is like, Hey, you know, you're kind of missing a childhood here. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I mean, I was, I was just working all the time and not, it, it was just motion. It was just activity. Um, in fact, you know, it was almost like, well, you know, as long as I'm working really, as long as I'm trying, I think it means I'm not a bad guy. You ever have that feeling, you know, Definitely. Like nothing's really working, but man, as long as I'm driving to appointments somewhere, surely, you know, some good ought to come out of this somehow. And, and so, um, you know, I was totally missing the levers that, and, and the hinges that swing the doors. And, uh, but, but finally it, it did start to work. And, um, you know, my, the first time I heard about 80, 20, I think about, a, I read about it in a book and I was a sales manager at this next job, which actually was working. And, um, and it said, 20% of your customers generate 80% of your sales and the other 80% of the customers only generate 20%. So there's the 20 and the 80. And I printed out this QuickBooks document. I was like, 
well, I'll be darned. That's actually true. I got in my calculator and I looked and yeah, that's, that's right. But I still didn't get it. I thought, well, that's interesting. And then I moved on and I didn't understand that what it really meant was that there were customers that I needed to fire because we actually lost money every time we sold them something for reasons that were not very obvious to me. Um, I didn't really understand what it meant to focus on the top 20% of my customers. And, and, And there's several other things I just completely didn't get. What I really didn't get was that it's, it's fractal. Now that's a weird word. That's kind of a weird techie word. But what it means is that there's an 80-20 inside every 80-20. So, so if I look at that top 20% of my customers that are generating 80% of the sales, if I just chopped off the rest and looked at just the top 20%, 80-20 was still true. The top 20% of those would still generate 80% of that revenue. And it's true again. It's true again. So, I mean, if you have a thousand customers, it's probably the case that the number one customer is like 25% of your business. They're one one thousandth of your customer base, but they're one fourth of your business. And, and not only that, you can probably make that customer even bigger with comparatively little effort compared to anywhere else that you could apply that effort. Um, and I didn't, I didn't know that this is absolutely everywhere. I, I had no idea that I could look at almost any column in any spreadsheet in the business or for that matter, uh, the files on my hard drive or the traffic on the roads on the streets outside and 80, 20 is still true. I mean, it's just everywhere. And so it's, it's like the most fundamental principle that nobody ever taught you in school. And people kind of casually talk about it. They don't really know what they're talking about. They, they don't get it. And, and, and so that's why we're talking today. <laughs> and this is definitely a really uh, great topic. I was introduced to it by Steve Scott, who is um, – I talked to him at episode six of the Breakthrough Success podcast. But I, mean, I, I see the 80-20 applying to so many other areas, not just uh, customers and how we use our time, but a lot of other areas, as you mentioned – and uh, there are people who are definitely living that lifestyle that you were able to get out of where you, you feel like you're putting in activity as long as you're doing something. Uh, you feel like it's like you're doing good, but being able to see which few, like 20% of the task lead to 80% of the results, that could be a really big game changer. And reviewing like uh, how we're utilizing our time is really going to help us figure out our 80-20, but uh, how exactly do we find more time to pursue uh, the 20% of tasks that yield 80% of the results or the 20% of customers that bring in 80% of the revenue? So l- let me illustrate this with uh, like uh, something that happens every day. Okay. So somebody calls the dentist office and they need $3,000 of dental work done And a lady puts them on hold for two minutes and then the person hangs up before somebody picks up. Okay. Now this happens probably 5,000 times every day somewhere, right? Okay. Well, so the person hangs up, they were going to spend $3,000 with you and now they're going somewhere else. You just lost $1,500 a minute on that phone call. Right. Um, and, and we all know it's true. OK, well, you know, how much is that an hour? Is that like isn't that like one hundred and eighty thousand dollars an hour? I have to pull my calculator to tell you something like I mean, it's an astronomical amount of money. Right now, what people don't realize is that the value of time is not on a 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars an hour additive scale, it's on a ten hundred thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand dollars an hour scale. So literally that phone call, the, th- the, the two minutes of making somebody feel ignored that cost you three thousand dollars, that 
time was worth $100,000 an hour, okay? And if the receptionist never put anybody on hold, she could somehow manage to always, you know, talk to the right person at the right time and get them handed off to the next right person and never let any anything slip through those cracks, that person would instantly be worth how much more per year? Like how many more cases would you get? How many more crowns or, you know, or, or, or whatever uh, would the dentist uh, sell? Okay. And, and see, so part of 8020 is that everything is exponential. So this whole idea of 10, 100,000, $10,000 an hour, this is like every entrepreneur has, and, and, and in 8020 sales and marketing in my book, I actually have a chart. It's like, so here's a list of $10 an hour tasks and it's stuff like emptying the trash and going to office depot and, um, and, and doing filing and sorting out a spreadsheet and like all these kinds of, and there's lots and lots of these $10 an hour kind of tasks. And then you have $100 an hour tasks, which are talking to an actual customer to help them solve a problem or, you know, doing something really relevant in your business. There's, there's some of that, but then there's, then there's thousand dollar an hour work. Um, a lot of marketers try to outsource work that's really $1,000 an hour work. So, for example, so wrote the world's best-selling book on Google advertising and Facebook advertising. People try to outsource that stuff all the time. It's some of the hardest stuff that there is to outsource. And if you actually learn it, it's actually worth $1,000 an hour to do it um, because it has so much leverage. It is the voice of your business. It is where customers actually make contact. And any time that you're at the exact point where a customer makes a decision, you're almost always dealing with thousand dollars an hour work or higher, many times $10,000 an hour. And you know, the, the $10,000 an hour might only last for a minute, but it's big. And, and so, uh, so your, your time is this way, your customers are this way, your product defects are this way, your vendors are this way, um, the people that you learn from are this way. And so when you understand this, it actually flips up everything upside down. The 80-20 the view of time is that we have plenty of time. There's lots of time. There's, you know, if you're going to live to be 70 years old, there's plenty of time. It's just that most people waste 95% of it. And, and so you, you have enough time to do what you want to do in your life, but you have to completely think differently about your time. And you have to say no to a lot of things. So one of the successful qualities of entrepreneurs and anyone in general is that ability to say no to a lot of things. And uh, the task that we do the worth of that task, I mean, depending on it, what task we're doing, it could be worth so much, like anything from like $10 an hour to like thousands of dollars an hour based on the skills that we have and what task uh, we're doing at that particular moment. And those are like the parts of like the more valuable parts fit into that 20% that's leading to 80% of the results. We also have uh, 80% of our efforts only leading to 20% of our results. And I feel like some people, uh, they don't feel like they could get rid of the tasks right away in their lives that are that 80% that are only leading to 20% of the results. So how, Perry, do you suggest that we gradually get rid of 80%? So like 80% of the customers who are only leading to 20% of the revenue or 80% of our workload that's only leading to 20% of our progress. So let's say you're a solo entrepreneur and you don't have a lot of money and you're scrambling around, you're doing a million things. And, and when you're in that position, um, it's really tempting to hand off a super critical customer centric thing to somebody else because it's intimidating, right? Like copywriting can be intimidating or, or buying ads on the internet could be intimidating. But what, what I suggest you do, start by outsourcing the most basic tasks in your life, like laundry or house cleaning. Um, it, it could be having the kids do it. It could be, you know, hiring somebody by, 
you know, putting a notice on the coffee shop bulletin board that you need somebody to come in for five hours a week and do some light housework. Those kind of, it's easy to find people that can do stuff like that. Like if you're, if you're any kind of real entrepreneur, you probably shouldn't be mowing your lawn. You probably shouldn't be shoveling your snow. You probably shouldn't be driving your car to the mechanic. You have somebody else drive your car to the mechanic and then you talk to the mechanic on the phone instead of spending the extra half an hour a day to, to do that. Um, you might take an Uber and take your reading or your laptop with you rather than driving yourself. Frankly, if your time's worth more than about 30 or $40 an hour, then you should do that. In fact, not terribly long ago, I sold my car and I mostly just take Uber or maybe if I, uh, if I need to go somewhere far away, I'll, I'll use one of my kids' cars or something like that. But I, I mean, I've really rethought whole sections of my life, uh, just going through the ten hundred thousand dollar an hour grid. Going, um, I mean, my time is worth a lot of money. If I'm in the back of a car, if, if I have some reading to do, reading in the back of a car instead of being in the front seat and behind the steering wheel is actually very valuable. People are like, well, when do I have time to read? Well, you're driving, right? So um, you really need to question assumptions. And I would like to go to that Uber example because that's the thing that really interests me. I've always been thinking of listening to audiobooks in that type of a situation, but uh, getting the Uber is another great option, especially if you are at that point, as you mentioned, 30 to 40 hours per week, but it does take time to uh, get the car and it takes a certain amount of time for the car to come. Uh, with those things that I mentioned, do you still find it worth a lot to take the Uber route instead of driving yourself in those uh, closed situations? Well, that that's on a, that depends on the exact situation, but generally, yeah. Now let, let's talk about um, uh, so, something else that's, that's kind of related. So like y you've got You've got the five minutes that you're waiting for, you know, an Uber to arrive. Now, uh, most people have lasted into a habit of any time they got like three minutes or five minutes or something, uh, they flip into, I call it micro boredom and they jump on social media and they, so they get on Twitter, or Instagram or Facebook and, and they, and they get this little dose of entertainment, right? You know, and then, you know, and then the Uber comes or whatever, you know what I, I am almost never on social media. Now I advertise on social media. I actually make great use of those things, but as a consumer of social media, I use very little of it. Now, um, here's what I found. I found that when you mentally check out, go take a mental vacation for five minutes and go into social media, particularly it actually starts chewing up your brain with all kinds of distractions because social media has deliberately evolved to consume as much of your attention as humanly possible. So there's this Darwinian competition with all, all the algorithms to put the stuff in front of you that, that's going to most push your buttons in the shortest period of time. My, I find that most people's minds are cluttered and you actually have to discipline yourself. So I deleted f the Facebook app off my phone. I delivered the de deleted the Twitter app off my phone, and I'm very deliberate. And there's there's two things that I do when I've got an idle two minutes or five minutes or something like that. Number one is every day I figure out what's my question of the day. Like, what is the biggest problem that I am trying to solve right now that I do not know the answer to? What is it? And I will write it down, okay? And and I'll go to work on that. And if I got two minutes, I'm like, uh, okay, let's chisel away at this question. Now, it's a lot harder work than checking Facebook, I guarantee you. But it's it's actually, that can be $1,000 an hour work just, just trying to figure that out. The, the other thing is being very deliberate about reading. You know, if you take that two minutes or five minutes or whatever, um, over a space of a month, you can read an entire book with those little, you know, interruptions and it could be on the Kindle app on your phone. But 
it's a completely different mindset than getting stimulated by social media. And I, I think it's kind of ironic that a guy wrote a who wrote a Facebook book is telling you don't be on Facebook. But, you know, it's kind of like if you if if you work at a restaurant, if you're a chef at a restaurant, you're in the kitchen cooking, you're not in the dining room shoveling food in your mouth. And honestly, a lot of online marketers and internet entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in general um, they're completely oblivious to the difference between consuming social media and creating social media. They're two completely different things. Completely. I see myself using that chef uh, analogy there because that's one of the best ways I've ever heard it said where uh, the chef isn't eating food in the dining room, similar to how we would be consuming content, but um, how the chef is just creating food. I absolutely love that reference and I could easily think about that for a little longer but i mean we'll, we'll shift back but uh <laughs> the uh 80 20 i feel like a lot of people get the idea uh especially after listening to this interview where it's like uh 80 of your results come from 20 percent of your work and based on how that sentence reads and the whole theory behind it i can see how with 80 20 you are able to work less and make more but I was wondering if you could go a little deeper into that whole idea of how we could be working less, but then making more in the process. So 80-20 is true. Like almost anything that you look at, there's an 80-20 going on. Okay. So if you go to the beach with a bucket and you, and you scoop some sand, the size of sand in that bucket will be 80-20. So so 80% of the space will be taken by 20% of the sand, which are the big ones, and 20% of the space will be taken by 80%, which are the, the little ones. And it's it's true of the, the traffic on the streets in your town. And well, so then it's it starts also being true not, a, not only of the positive things in your business, but the negative things too. Okay, so so 20% of the product effects create 80% of the warranty returns, for example, which means that if you could completely fix one thing or two things, most of your headaches will go away, let's say with a, a defective product. Now, here's an advanced version of this, um, and, and I want to explain it very carefully because it's it's a bit of a brain bender, okay? And uh, my friend Lynn Bergen came up with this. It's called the 2120 rule. And here's what it says it says 20% of your customers create 120% of your profits. Okay. That's the best 20% of your customers. And the worst 20% of your customers lose money bringing your 120% back down to 100. Okay. So in other words, last year you made 120% of what you took home, but then bad customers ate up the 20% and, and got you back down to whatever you, you know, whatever you earned last year. Okay. And you would actually make more money if you fired the right customers. And it's, it's true. And probably somewhere between three to 15% of your customers, if you got rid of them, you would immediately make mo more money the next day, even though they weren't writing you checks anymore, because maybe you're literally taping dollar bills to every product that goes out to those customers, or, you know, they're, they're chewing up all kinds of time. Like I, I gave a presentation to a room full of certified public accountants and I said, so how many of you have that tax customer where, um, like they send you all these emails and they deluge you with paperwork and they don't really pay that much money and they, they hassle you all the time. And like, and all these hands go up every, they all had one. I said, okay, so you have my permission to send them a letter that says, you know, we're doing a restructuring in our company and we're changing our strategy. And unfortunately in 2018, we won't be able to keep you on as a client. And so we, we have a, a handoff process and we have a, a number of other excellent accountants that we're going to refer you to and you just move them off your plate. Now it's true. It's true of customers. 
you know, that probably 10% of your customers, you're actually losing money. It's also true of products. If you have a bunch of different products you sell, probably 10% of them, you actually tape dollar bills to everyone that goes off. And, and, and so you actually have to really look at them and you go, so are we actually making money on this customer? Are we actually making money on this product? Now, sometimes you can figure out pretty quick. Sometimes you might have to do hours or days of digging and analysis to find out. But I'm telling you what, you know, what, what happens if you, if you reduce your customers and your products by 10%, but you make more money, that's less work. It's less everything. It's less he headaches, less overhead, less electricity, less conversations. And, and I, I actually think that, that people need to actually schedule space in their life. You need to schedule time to do nothing or time to just read or time to sleep. Like how many people should be getting seven hours of sleep and they're only getting five? Like how common is that? Like what if you actually came to work rested? What would that be like? Perry, thank you for sharing with us those very valuable insights on how we can use 80-20 to work less and make more. And I love those questions that you were asking because these little things like uh, getting some extra rest or something like that, I, I mean, there are so many ways that we could do this, can make a really big difference. And uh, like some of the, I didn't think about the negative side of 80-20 where there are certain customers eating away at your profits and that can prevent you from uh, achieving the full potential that your business can achieve. And going on the subject of potential, uh, I feel like the reason that people do not um, achieve their full potential, it's a lot of different things. And I'm wondering, uh, what do you believe holds most people back from reaching their full potential? Well, one of them is they don't know how they sell and persuade. And, um, I created a tool called the marketing DNA test because I realized that, uh, after working with thousands of entrepreneurs, uh, of every size of company that you can imagine, um, every level of income you can imagine 300 different industries, I started to see some patterns and, and I, I started to see, you know, there are people who, they sell by sitting in their cave, crafting a piece of copy for six weeks and then they get it all right. And then they put it out and they do a big product launch and, you know, they make uh, half a million dollars show up. Right. There, and there's other people, they don't, they don't do that at all. Um, they parachute into a situation, they march into a room, they start negotiating and, 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 and selling and, and mixing it up with other people and I call them hostage negotiators and they're completely different than the, the guys that'll sit there and write a piece of copy, you know, and there, there's people that'll sell with emotions and heartstrings and stories. And there's people that sell with spreadsheets and analysis and proof. And they're all different And that people have to figure out how do I naturally sell? How do I naturally persuade? Well, this will determine a lot of things. This this will determine, are you a blogger or are you a YouTuber? Are you a fa social media person or do you sell on webinars or do you sell in person or are you a copywriter? And of course, I know all the different people listening, there, there's all kinds of different versions of this out there. You know, some of you do really, really well on LinkedIn and some of you do really, really well when you're sitting in a room just having a heart to heart conversation with a customer. And so... I made this test, which uh, we sell it for $37 separately, but there's a there's a link, a free link inside the 80-20 sales and marketing book where you can take it without paying the fee. And, 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 and it tells you, it tells you exactly how you sell and how you persuade. Now, there's an 80-20 because if you made a list of like 10 different ways that people persuade, any one person is going to have on two of those 10, um, 80% of their selling power is going to be in those two and only 20% is going to be in the other eight. And so we figured, well, if we can figure out, uh, somebody's top 
you know, one or two or three selling modalities and just put him in that situation every time. I had a guy who ran a roofing company figure this out. And as a result of, of understanding his marketing DNA, he stopped going to roofing appointments and he started just recording little videos and sending them to the customers after the crew came to do a quote. And he doubled his closing rate. And and all of a sudden, he wasn't spending all this time in, the, in his pickup truck. Now, I'm not saying this would work for everybody, but it worked for him based on his unique marketing DNA. So he was thrilled. I mean, he, he sent me the numbers. It was really impressive. Like, he doubled his roofing sales from the previous month. He's like, I had no idea this was possible. I never even thought about this, you know, that, that he could sell more by not even going to see anybody. So I, I, re I definitely recommend that you do that. Harry, thanks for sharing that really awesome insight. And there's so many different ways to uh, present yourself and um, uh, in a way that tries to get uh, the customers to buy your products or services. And I really love that idea that there are so many different ways, but only a few of them will truly work for you and get the majority of your sales. And finding those to see which ones are going to get you sales, then focusing on those. So I really love that idea because I could definitely... Uh, increase the amount of sales that we make for our businesses. But in business, uh, challenges are just inevitable. Uh, like we constantly have to go through them and they're definitely prevalent as we 80-20 uh, our businesses and make better decisions based on what the 80-20 tells us. So what do you believe is one, um, what is one challenge that you faced on your journey and a powerful lesson you learned during that challenge? Well, I, I learned that I, I learned that if you um, if you take resources away from the ineffective 80 percent and you pour resources in to the super effective 20 percent that you get 16 times the leverage. So I'll tell you a quick story. Um this was now the story I'm telling you. This was in 2004, so the world's changed quite a bit. But I, but I hope you can get get the the principle. So at that time, I was selling ebooks uh, on Google AdWords, and they were selling like hotcakes. And I had all these customers, and you know they they were selling for like 49.99 bucks, and we'd give people this package of stuff, and they would download it on our website. I had this friend come to me and he goes, he goes, Perry, you're leaving a bunch of money on the table and uh, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. And I said, okay. He, he says, there's a whole bunch of people, they bought your book, they like your book, they like Perry, they like everything, but but the problem is they're never actually going to do this. He goes, I know I'm one of them. I, I'm never actually going to sit down and read your book and do it. He goes, I need somebody to handhold me through the whole thing and kind of spoon feed it and and – and like break it down. He said, you need to do a coaching program where you, t you start, you know, with very first click and you work all the way through Google AdWords, teach them how to do the keywords, how to do everything. He said, you know, you should do this online series of teleseminars and stuff. And, and so I knew he was, he said, he said, if you do this, there's only one condition um, he goes, if you do this and you make a million dollars, you have to write a $10,000 check to make to my favorite charity. And I'm like, okay, you're on. And I knew he was right. And in fact, I did my 80, 20 math because 80, 20 will tell you if, you know, if X number, if, if, if a thousand people will pay $50 for an ebook, how many of them will pay $5,000 for a coaching program where it's all boutique and, and you walk them through. And I did the math and, and it said, well, you know, you're going to make like $150,000 when you do this, which just completely scared me. Like I'd never sold $150,000 before we launched it. And sure enough, it, it sold $150,000. And, yeah. um, that ended up, we ended up running that program for 10 years and I did write a $10,000 check to Bill's favorite charity. Um, and, and, and it, it was really great, but, uh, you asked me like, what was the challenge that, you know, that all sounds like an easy story in a certain way it was. 
And you can do that too. I call it an espresso machine. It's like, it's one thing to sell a latte for $5. It's another thing to sell a $2,700 espresso machine. 8020 tells you how many espresso machines you will sell based on the lattes. But, but here was the challenge. And I find this is true of any conscientious person. If you are trying to do something economically that's above what you have ever done, your procrastination demons and your head trash will go into overdrive. Okay. Every time I sat down to work on that project to put that program together, my procrastination demons would go crazy. Like I sit down in front of my keyboard. Okay. I'm going to write, I'm going to write the sales letter. And all of a sudden a voice inside of my head says, Perry, you need a haircut. Go get a haircut. <laughs> and I would feel like going and getting a haircut. It's like, no, I don't need a haircut. I certainly don't need one right now. I need to finish this, okay? And I actually use this to figure out what's important on my plate. Like, if my procrastination demons are not at all bothered about project A, it probably means it's no big deal. It's not going to get me anywhere. If my procrastination de demons are trying to drag me away from project Z, um, I pro it's probably a really good sign that's going to make a whole bunch of money. And so uh, you actually have to like harness those bastards in reverse. <laughs> I... Again, I'm really amazed with that insight. I'm thinking it over now. I mean, like we do, de we definitely procrastinate on things that lead to the biggest impact. And it's like responding to email, for instance, or like checking social media. Like, there's no right. procrastinator at all that's gonna say, uh, "Don't check social media." Uh, this right? Is, yeah, and I because it's mean, ten dollar an hour work. Yeah, it's not thousand. It's not ten thousand. I mean that that when I did that project. At least in in my best parts of it, when I was really in my groove, I mean that was probably ten thousand dollar an hour work. And 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 we used that promotion over and over for years. It was great, but when I was putting it together, man, I could just I just I could feel in my gut. It's like um, it's like I think subconsciously I knew that this was going to change my life and we're all scared of change. Like, and we often know this about ourselves. Like, yeah, I know, I know we think we're programs for success and all that. We're, well, we're also programmed for failure. Like it kind of goes in both directions, you know, like you really, you really got to wrestle that thing to the ground and, and really know what's going on with yourself. And a lot of times we don't, it's, it's why we have coaching groups. It's why we have masterminds. It's why you get together with other people. It's why you have accounting groups and partners and stuff. It's like, man, like we, we got to beat ourselves into submission to get stuff done sometimes. And I definitely agree with that. I mean, this podcast, for instance, it took me three tries to start it. Like the first time <laughs> I gave up on it, second time I gave up on it. Uh, like the only reason I even started this was I like, sent emails to people before I could even fully think about what I was doing. And then I had like nothing can make me procrastinate now when like five people said yes. So, I mean, sometimes you just got to force yourself to take the action. Yes. Yes. You trick um, a, a lot of, I mean, it depends of course on what you sell, but a lot of marketers have to just like write the sales promotion and then build the product after they promised that it would be available because that's how you force yourself to do stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, and so if you point yourself in the right direction, you can force yourself to do stuff that matters, you know, and then you say, no, you get no to the social media, no to constantly checking the email box, um, no to the barnacles. Perry, thank you for sharing those really awesome insights. And, um, with anything that we're procrastinating with, I mean, that's just a sign that, this is something that you actually need to be doing. So we could just totally use our procrastinations as guides for some of the things that we should yeah. be pursuing. And uh, speaking of different guides that can lead us towards success, uh, throughout this interview, I've gotten the idea that you read a lot of books based on some of the uh, different references we've had. And I'm wondering if you could share with us three books that would help us grow our businesses. Uh, okay. One book would be the star principle by Richard Koch, which I think is one of the most underrated business books there is. And like everybody should read that book, um, because it, it's the 80, 20 of what business you should be in. 
and most people are in the wrong business or in the, they're in the wrong part of a business or they're in the wrong part of a market. And if they changed a little bit. So um, the 80-20 principle by Richard Koch, that would be one. Uh, another one would be uh, the book of Proverbs in the Bible. Um, and uh, what I want to say about that is, you know, in if you make – there's two kinds of business mistakes, okay? There are – there are mistakes of tactics and strategy and judgment, and, and that's one kind of mistake. But there's another kind of mistake, which is mistakes of basically integrity, morality, and, um, and, and courage, okay? And business schools and entrepreneurial courses, they almost never focus on that second part. That's what Proverbs is actually about. So, like, if, if you – if you build like a hundred million dollar company and then it blows up because you un, you ma made an error in the price of gasoline or something, the world will forgive you. But if you create a like a moral disaster like an Enron, there's people that will never forgive you. Okay, and Proverbs is about keeping you from making those kind of mistakes. Three thousand years old, best business book ever. And then um, another book that I think is uh, really good is How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. Um, and that it's a rollicking good read. He's a brutally honest guy. I mean, he even admits that at one point he had 14 mistresses on the payroll. Now, I'm not a 14 mistresses on the payroll guy at all, and he tells you it was a really bad idea. But it gives you an idea how just completely honest the book is. So there's three, like, those probably a lot of people have never read those three books. Perry, thank you for sharing with us those book recommendations. And with the exception of Proverbs, I don't think I've heard any of those other books getting referenced. So those are definitely new books that will expand our horizons. And uh, one of the things that I love asking guests, and you've actually done this already, but I'd love to get your insights on this again. Uh, I've asked a lot of questions throughout this episode. And uh, with that in mind, I'm wondering, what is one question you believe we need to be asking ourselves more often? Um, it, it is, how do I listen and discern as opposed to merely think and strategize? Um, and so this goes to um, sharpening your own intuition in your gut in your sixth sense, it also speaks to your ability to pray and listen and hear the muse. Um, how so? The question would be, how can I sharpen my discernment and my ability to listen? I I define discernment as the ability to know things that you could never figure out with pure logic or with the information that has been given you. You're in an ambiguous situation. You're trying to figure out which path to go on, and you simply don't have enough information. So can you sense what's the right direction in your gut or in your spirit without being told? And I think, I think that is like a, a $100,000 an hour skill. Perry, thank you for sharing with us that one question that you believe we need to be asking ourselves more often and for – all of the breakthrough success listeners wondering who want to learn more about you and read some of your books, where can we find you on the web? Uh, you can get 80, 20 sales and marketing on Amazon. It's also an audible and audio book, but what I would recommend that you do, you can get it for $10 less and get it with more stuff. If you go to perrymarshall.com slash 80, 20, and we'll ship it anywhere in the U.S. for $7, including shipping, total cost 7 bucks, or international 14 And you'll get some extra videos and some extra resources with it. And you can watch how we sell, how our sales machine works. You can learn a great deal from it. And you'll get the marketing DNA test included with it, which, um, you know, I had a, a, I had a computer programmer. He took the marketing DNA test. It said you should be a copywriter. 
18 months later, he was a freelance copywriter making a full-time living as an independent consultant, and he wasn't working for the man anymore. Joshua Earl, uh, and he, he writes copy mostly in the computer programming industry, and he makes a great living doing it. And uh, he's now been a, on his own for, I think, two years, and he's doing great. Uh, so that's a marketing DNA success story. All right, Breakthrough Success listeners, those links and the show notes will be at marketbury.com slash E89. Perry, it was such a pleasure to have you on the Breakthrough Success Podcast. Thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Thanks for your questions and for your openness. It was really a pleasure to talk to you. Breakthrough Success listeners, I need your help to keep this show running. I choose not to use sponsored ads in my episodes to provide you with a better experience. However, This decision gives me little money to pay for storage in my team, which comes over to over $1,000 per month. So please consider supporting the Breakthrough Success Podcast on Patreon by heading over to patreon.com slash markguberti. For as little as $1 per month, you can help Breakthrough Success stay running while taking advantage of exclusive content and other perks that come with being a patron. To help support Breakthrough Success, Head over to patreon.com slash markguberti or search for Breakthrough Success on Patreon. That way, I can maintain the Breakthrough Success podcast so it stays running and provide you 